is an hour of prayers. Every pain in your body, every organ that is not functioning normally, upon your kidney, upon your liver, upon your heart, upon your brain, let the power of God come upon your life now. Receive healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody there watching us right now, wherever you're viewing us from, this is your season for God to remember you. You may have cried, you may have wept your pillow, but this God who remembered Noah is going to remember you for good in the name of Jesus. Amen. And for you and for many that are watching us now, whatever that is strong, is there, is there any siege of the enemy? Is there any infection? Is there something wrong somewhere in your reproductive system? What a doctor said concerning you, whatever the handwriting of the world, whatever the handwriting of the enemy, whatever the handwriting of doctors, by the power of the Holy Spirit, all that we change now in the name of Jesus. While you may think you know everything about the issues and intrigue of matters arising in the society, there are many expositions that will shock, baffle and even enlighten you. The exclusive gifts episode of the exclusive on ACNN. I am Korede Akitsunde. On this special episode, I had the privilege of Speaking with His Grace, the Most Reverend Nicholas D. Oko, the Archbishop Metropolitan and Primate of all Nigeria, in his office in Abuja. I want you to have your seat as we take on the Primate on national issues, the church matters, both nation and internationally, and on, of course, the program that has come and gone, which is DIFCAN. Join me after this short break. Thank you. Welcome back from that short break. And I hope you've had your seat and taken a cup of water to listen to His Grace this moment. Your Grace, a lot has happened in the course of the year bordering on challenges of Christianity and national security. Uh, did you at any time feel that this country was heading for the precipice? I am an optimist. And I strongly believe in the divine rulership of the world. Which means that God ruled in the affairs of men. And so, when human beings are panicking and getting agitated about so many things, and they speak from their narrow perspectives, I 
always prefer to rely on the understanding of God, which has the whole creation in mind. That God cannot create a Nigeria that we just wake up one day and evaporate. So I have always believed that it is well with Nigeria. Quite true, there are times when circumstances make people to begin to wonder whether there is a few, particularly during the 2015 election. Many people in Abuja were panicking. Those who have houses were selling their houses and returning to their ancestral areas east to the east, west to the west, and so on and so forth. But I was brought here by the whole Church of Nigeria, so I didn't panic about anything. Eventually, the cloudy wind gave way, and all of us are still here today. So I want to say that while I was uh, worried about what was happening, the way people were behaving, I have always believed that there will be a Nigeria, whatever happens. And therefore, it is better to get myself ready to make my own contributions in a very humble way. It is in this light that I accepted to serve in the um, Peace Committee, a Peace Committee, uh, to add my own small voice to the call for peace for Nigeria, and uh, to relate with government in a way that we give confidence to the ordinary people that all is well. So this is. Uh, what I want to say about the fear of the future. Your Grace, we, we also had these same challenging challenges going to October 1. What was your message to the church then? Um, I, going to October 1, I knew it was pure politics. It was pure politics, not even but politics by the people who were speaking. Some people were speaking behind them, using them to speak. And because of that, I knew that it would go nowhere. Because if those people calculate that their portions will not be met, they will find a way to the answer. And as it turned out, those speaking did not know that uh, the consultations they had was not universal in the north. And then the leaders in the north, properly speaking, came to calculate their own fortune in the light of what the young people were asking for. And they discovered that they will be um, ill affected if that will happen. Because in fact, it will lead to total disintegration. It was not just an order for the egos. It was an order that we spark out, spark off other orders. For instance, the Niger Delta people gave their own orders, and other subgroups gave their own orders, and quickly spread to the West. So Nigeria was already disintegrating. The overall interest of everybody was to withdraw the the, the whole statement. They were they had no choice. The insurgents in the northern parts of Nigeria has caused a lot of havoc, particularly to the church. Can you please tell us how the Anglican Church is recovering from this? And uh, most especially, what is the cost from the devastation? Before the Boko Haram, we had intended to create a diocese at Mubi. We had intended 
to create a diocese at Taku in Taraba. And of course, some parts of Northwest. But because of Boko Haram activities, we have to share all that. In fact, Medugri diocese became completely reduced to just the few church, the, the, some churches in the metropolis. All the neighboring towns and subordinate uh, uh, parishes and so on were decimated. So we are starting afresh. It's, uh, unfortunately, the bishop who was at Maiduguri died. Died uh, about uh, how many months ago now? In, it was uh, February last year. Yes. February this year. And uh, we have just replaced the bishop with a, a new a young man whom we believe can raise the standard again. So it's like starting afresh. And you know what it means to start afresh? Money is involved, staff is involved, infrastructure is involved. And the security challenges have not disappeared completely. So, uh, as you know, you'll hear about Boko Haram activities. They are still continuing. It's not as if it's gone. That of Takun, uh, if, you, if you are there, only people in Taraba State know how much heat and run is there with these headsmen and the problems. So everything has been terribly affected by that. Our diocese in Damatu was closed down. Closed down. It's only recently now that we again, we put a, bishop, a new bishop there to go and start afresh. It's a, it's a very costly venture. Yet, we blame nobody. That is the type of story we have to tell at this time in our country. Well, Your Grace, uh, we would like you to rate the performance of President Muhammad Buhari so far, especially in his anti corruption crusade. For me, and, uh, going by the anti corruption crusade, he has succeeded. Why? Not necessarily judging by the number of people who have been jailed. Not necessarily judging by the uh, amount of money recovered. By, but by emphasizing the fact that corruption is a wrong thing. That corruption is a wrong thing. And so, which should not become our way of life. That you put somebody in an office, the first thing he does is how to corner the whole the allocation in the office for himself and his family. If his, that is the only success to tell our ministers, to tell our governors, to tell our uh, vice chancellors, to tell our head of institutions, and anybody holding any appointment that stealing government money is not a correct thing. By that standard, by that you say the law, I think he has succeeded doing something. To, it's, a, it's like calling back. We have lost the sense of sin in this country. We lost the sense of sin. In fact, some people started calling it miracle. They steal and say the miracle has happened. They go to church to go and do thanksgiving for, for doing the wrong thing. So if only that recall to the knowledge of evil, to the sense of sin, and the, desire, the need for national rebirth, if only for that, Think he has done well. And uh, also on, on other matters, how will you rate 
this government on other matters apart from anti-corruption? On other matters, I will appeal to him to spread his love across the country. Nigerians call him Baba. He should merit the title. Baba is a noble, respectable title, and he deserves it at his age. But if he's uh, not careful in the way he allows his uh, subordinates to help him, in running the place, they will discredit him greatly. Because you say that, if you say you are the, the head, you are the leader, and all your children cannot come close to you, then what, what is the meaning of the Baba? A Baba should attract all his children. We are, you see, we are, we are Africans. If you locate that in the African polygamous system, eh, a man can have as many as five wives. If the, any children from a particular woman calls the man the papa, and he doesn't want to answer, it means he's discriminating against those ones. So fair treatment. Death Crimson. I hope you've been enjoying the conversation with His Grace, the Most Reverend Nicholas D. Hoko, the primate of all Nigeria, Anglican Communion. I want you to join me after this short break. Don't go away. Welcome back from that short break, uh, and I hope you are uh, still yet seated at your screen to listen to His Grace, because we are now going more deep into to this exclusive. Sir, do you support the agitation for restructuring of Nigeria, or do you think Nigeria should continue the same way it is running presently? It depends on what you mean by restructuring. What I have always been telling the political el elites to do, tell Nigerians what you mean by restructuring, or it has failed. But if we go on with this omnibus uh, term, there's restructuring, nobody knows whether we, that's what we wanted or what they told us or what they did not tell us. So the first thing is definition. Looking at the polity, I think the challenge of people talking about restructuring is about the quality. They say the current system is not working. Do you think that the current political system will run demands restructuring? Over the years, Nigeria has been in a state of flux. Will be changing, 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 changing. I think that we have not changed enough yet. So if the idea of restructuring is going to help us, then we go for it. Look at it. We changed from ECN to NEP to NEPA. From NEPA to PHCN. Yes, yes. From PHCN to discourse now, the discussion or whatever they are called, nobody knows. Before, secondary school, school terms used to end in December. Eh? And then they changed it, started ending in September. Then, uh, secondary school course was five years. They changed it to three, three Six, six, three, three, four. Has anything changed? People now who read six years, they cannot write as well as people who read five years. Are you following me? 
So then we were doing parliamentary system. Now we change it to presidential system. Now we are complaining again already. So what I'm saying is that we have not changed enough, we have not arrived. We are changing so that if we get to the one that is working for us, then everybody will say, oh, praise God, we have arrived. Again, under Buari, we talked about reviewing the system and its performance. Will you say the church has the fear of Islamiz Islamization of the country? Whether we have the fear? Has there been fear of this? What I will say is that what is afflicting us more is Christian disunity. A group of people who are not united, anybody can harm them. If you have a family, if this man is on his own, this one is on his own, this one is on his own, this one is on his own, and this one, by the day the day enemy will come, who will, who will stand? So the problem of the church. It's not so much an external body, but an internal body. And what is even more, we are beginning to observe that there is a wide gap between what we profess and what we do. This yearning gap between what we sing in the church, the hectic dancing, there is hectic dancing in the church, and all this and all that but it is not matched by staunch Christian moral character. People, if you doubt, they just after a program in the church, you see people beating traffic lights. Mm -hmm. Just the simplest thing. It does not occur to that man that the worship that is coming from the worship of God, who is orderly, that that traffic light is part of God's instruction in order to organize people to do things properly. So, either there are people teaching us and not teaching us well, or there is a new, a new religion that is uh, what, what, what we call popular religion which is not Christianity. It's a Christianity that is being driven by dance, music, trumpet, a cornet, and all sorts of things, an acrobatic display in the church. But it's devoid of the solid quality of spirituality. We've seen industries uh, folding up and uh, churches coming up from some of these industries that have folded up. Industries closing down? Yes. Uh, based on your last statement, should we say this is a good development or a bad one for the church and for the nation? Oh, it's not a good development. How can it be? You first see, to pray is to walk. To walk is to pray. If the whole day you do nothing, but you go to the church and be dancing and be singing, you are not doing a positive thing. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden. It was not to admire the flowers. It was to look after them, to walk. So when you are not walking, when you are idle, you are not praising God. So to close down our factories, close down our industry and turn them to church, it's not a positive development. Because in any case, whether the factories close down or if they are functioning, the praise of God will never stop. It will never stop.
Many have accused Christian leaders of not being with political leaders and finding it difficult to tread close to the power. Do you believe in this? Um, I will say yes, I will say no. Yes, because some people, in an attempt to relate with power, have messed up themselves. The, the intention was to get closer so that they can influence, the, uh, influence power with positive and godly ideas. But instead, they have allowed power to mold them into their own image. That's why I say that's the correct observation. But secondly, it is not everybody. There are some who have not bowed their knees to bow. They are still speaking. One thing is that people in power, they are not easily uh, amenable to discipline. Very easily, they see their power as uh, something nobody should challenge. And any comment you make, they think you are attacking them. And they want to harm you. So, in that case, some have withdrawn, leaving them to themselves, which is not actually the best. They say power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So if they allow themselves to be so corrupt, to be corrupted absolutely, they will ruin themselves, they will ruin their families, they will ruin the country. In other words, they will ruin all of us. So as much as is possible, we should not stop to, be, to engage in our prophetic ministry be willing to pay the price through the grace of God. Make the necessary sacrifice. Whether authorities in power recognize us or not recognize us, or in fact, whether they persecute us. We are not going to be the first. We are not going to be the second. We are not going to be the last. It happened before. It's going to happen again. Sir, you are one of the people advocating for the revival of the Nigeria's Interreligious Council. Why are you advocating for it and why now? NIREC, I suspect that's what you are talking about. Yes, sir. I was a member. Our, myself, Sultan, and all these other people, uh, many others. And it was helping us to look at issues within religion and across religion and to make recommendations to the, 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 the leadership of the country. All of a sudden, it ran into bad waters with politics and uh, they stopped. We stopped. They didn't really stop us. They just say, we put, uh, let the meeting be next time, let the meeting be next time, let the meeting until, until today we have not had any meeting again. So we want it to be revived so that the issues across religion will be discussed. And we discuss frankly. And we hope that those who are members will go back and carry their members, uh, their leader members along. And even we even got to a point where we agreed that we should decentralize it so that from the top we will have state branches and the local government branches to reach the grassroots so that the knowledge of what we are doing will cut across and it will help to mobilize everybody for peace and harmony. So Your Grace, what is being done to revive it? Um, we have spoken to the government. And government, let me tell you, government is sometimes stubborn. They may not act until there is an emergency, until there is something acting on the government, and they begin to look for solution. 
and they discover that this type of thing can be of help to us. So they may want to use us for political ends. Until such a time presents itself, if you push too much, they think you have something to collect. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the, the issue around the Christendom. We've seen the case of what is trending presently online and somewhere in the past uh, few weeks on the issue of Titan in churches. What is the stand of the Anglican Church on Titan? Um, Titan is a very ancient tradition. Um, Abraham paid tight. Is it to Melchizedek? And uh, people have become transfixed to that idea till today. But in the New Testament, given modalities uh, have other options. One, he said, set aside something every week. Calculate by yourself. Set aside something you think will be handsome for the glory of God. And you give that. Whether that is 10% or whatever percent, I don't know. But the, the instruction is set aside something every week. Then there is the gift that is requiring you to give all. The first concept of that is that your life is a living sacrifice. You, you know, you know a, a sacrifice? Something you offer and you take away your hand. That means that the, the, the Christian offers his life totally. And the totality of his training, his money, his everything that he has belongs to God. Therefore, the question of saying, God, take 10%, I have uh, 90% does not arise. Let, let me give you an, uh, an example. If you are a tighter and you give 10% in the church, and after giving the 10%, Somebody is sick and very sick, and you still have your 90%. Are you going to close your eyes? So, you see, that is one of the weaknesses of Titan if you follow it mechanically. Then, furthermore, in, the, in the John chapter 6, Jesus asked people who have food to bring it. Some brought, uh, they, they did not bring, only one young man who had a pack lunch. That pack lunch, two pieces of fish, five body loaves. He, the mother gave it to him to eat as he was going about with uh, Jesus so that he would not be hungry. When Jesus asked for the bread, it was not only that boy that had. Many had and they did not bring. But this boy brought his own. He did not give Jesus two pieces of fish and, and leave the, the barley loaves. He did not give two barley loaves and leave out the fish. He gave everything. And because he gave everything, the blessing of God multiplied it over and over so that the intention of the mother was met. The boy had enough to eat. Other people who were there, more than almost 20,000 people, had enough to eat and to spare. Now, those who had and did not bring, their own became a waste. So, the point in this matter is that when God is asking for something, you don't give him 10%. You give him what is worthy of his name. It might be more than 10%. It might be 10%. It might be anything, depending on the situation he has placed you 
bearing in mind that every good and perfect gift is from above. What is your take on the claims by some pastors that anyone who refuses to give tithes or 10% or uh, whatever percent is under divine cause? No, I don't believe it. I don't curse anybody. God does not compel us to go. He only makes us willing to go. If God has given you a gift, he rules your mind. He makes you to see why. Remember that the gift you give does not promote God. God does not, it was, not that he's a, a young officer. Now you have given so much, he will be promoted to a high officer, executive, or whatever rank. God is full. According to the theology of Colossians, God is full, complete. God is complete. The, when you give, it is you giving that is blessed. The one giving is the one lifted up. Not God. God is not hungry. He said, if I were, according to Psalm 50, if I were hungry of meat, I would not tell you. The whole cattle on the hills and everything belong to me. All right. Uh, this is getting more interesting and I know that you are still seated to your TV screen to watch this episode of the exclusive with his grace, the most reverend Nicholas D. Yoko the Archbishop Metropolitan and the Primate of Church of Nigeria, Anglican Communion. We'll be right back. Don't go away. The Anglican Cable Network Nigeria, ACNN, is your most reliable gospel TV station that brings to you quality TV programming which builds your spiritual life and enhance your walk with God through the undiluted Word of God. Join us on our social media platforms anytime you miss your favorite program. Subscribe to our YouTube channel with the address www.youtube.com forward slash ACNN TV and click that video that matters to you. Protect your vote is a euphemistic way of saying do everything to make sure you can share blood, you can kill to ensure that the person you voted for is the one that will emerge as a winner at the end of the day. There is never a dull moment on our Facebook page as we are dedicated to keep you informed with the up-to-date news about the church and other information. Just log on to www.facebook.com forward slash TV for you can now watch some of our programs live on your mobile device. Follow us on Twitter with the handle at acnntv.com and you'll be glad you did. So now, there is no longer regret each time you miss any episode of your favorite programs as you can now watch them on the go, anytime, anywhere. ACNN, we are indeed reaching the world with the undiluted word of God. You're welcome back. So, let, let's, let me go back to his grace now. Your, your grace, um... Let's go around what is going on in the church worldwide now, and that is the issue of homosexuality. Uh, we want to know specifically the stand of the Church of Nigeria nationwide, particularly in Nigeria, on the issue of homosexualism. What is the stand of the church? Um, this matter is one of the new issues disturbing the church. Um, the Anglican church, because of its openness in approach to issues, have been discussing it and making it an issue. Other denominations decided to keep quiet. But we refuse to keep quiet. We are not embarrassed discussing it. And as a result of that, it has um, occasioned a division in our church. Some saying yes, some saying no. The position of the Church of Nigeria is that it is theologically wrong. That it is culturally wrong it is socially wrong. From the point of creation, theologically 
and for the interest of society, it is also wrong. Therefore, the church should not be identified with anything that is so terribly wrong, that is so terribly against humanity. And that's why the Church of Nigeria ruled against it. That anybody in that type of lifestyle is not doing the right thing. But we don't fight people. We don't kill people. We don't attack people. We don't refuse to greet people. If you say you are homosexual, good morning, good morning. Well, yes, you are not coming to uh, displace anybody. But according to our church, you will not be given any responsibility in our church because we do not believe in it. And in this, uh, moreover, we believe that it is an acquired syndrome. It is not as the people in the West are putting it, that it, that is how God created me. We do not believe that. Because in nature, everything God has created, he created them in pairs. If you go to human beings, you have man, male and female. You go to the goat, male and female. You go to cow, um, um, uh, cattle, male and female. You go to even the, the ones in the sea, they are both male and female. So the divine knowledge that provided for that sexual consummation provided the type of consummation that is needed. That's why it prescribed male and female. So, whether the birds in the air, even plants, you have both male and female. In this regard, you can't blame God. That is because he did not provide for my sexual consummation. That's why I have to resort to this. Uh, it's not my fault. They are telling a blatant lie against God. Let's just take the last part of this episode before we uh, call it a day. Your Grace, are there any suspected homosexuals in the house of Bishop? Which Bishop? Well, we have had a, a homosexual Bishop consecrated in New Hampshire in the U.S. And today, in the U USA, Canada, they are there. As much as we know, in Nigeria, there is none. Listen to me. As much as we know, and our knowledge is limited. Because if you now, you are homosexual, I wouldn't know. Especially if you refuse to own up. I don't put touch light in people's bedroom. All right. Yeah, the, the, His Grace has made us to know that one, he doesn't have a CCTV to watch any bishop in Church of Nigeria to know if they are. But as far as he knows, there is none. And uh, we also believe that there is none because the Anglican Church in Nigeria has come out verbally and in every other communication means to go against homosexuals. Sir, will you say the leadership of the uh, church in the U.S. and other places have heard by consecrating uh, homosexuals as bishops? Yes, they knew that and we told them so. As a result of which we broke relationship with them. Okay, sir. Apart from the issue of homosexuality, which I think is uh, much more popular around uh, what will you say is the greatest challenge faced by Christians first in Nigeria and then globally? Um, Christianity today, the greatest challenge is uh, one, it, it depends on the, the setting. 
in Nigeria here, the type of challenge we face may be different from the ones being faced by the Western world and the Eastern world. We take it in turn. In Nigeria, we have the challenge of traditional thought forms, which is uh, generally regarded as African traditional religion. That is a very serious challenge because African traditional religion has not died at all. It is, in some cases, is persecuting the, the Christian faith. In some cases, it's giving a very serious challenge to the church so that you don't know which one. Some people in a particular community, they are both traditional religious worshippers. They are also Christians, so-called Christians. So that gives a very wrong uh, note to people. They are both in the church, they are both in the traditional worship. And mark you that cultism is part of traditional worship. All these occult practices, uh, secret cults, they are part of traditional society. So in that case, they are all together a challenge to the church. That is one. Two, the, what I may call moderni, modernism. You know, this spread of uh, modern philosophies, it's not only in the Western world, it has also, it has also arrived in Nigeria. Take the issue of relativism, which is the way you see it. The way it seems to you may be different from the way it seems to me. So they dispense with what they call absolute truth. Now, that is also affecting us here. Many young people, they may go to church for music. They may go to church because they are bored at home. They may go to church because of one flimsy thing or the other, not necessarily because of God. So that is a challenge. How to make the young people to accept Christianity the way our parents did. Then, of course, there is the issue of militant Islam. Milit mil milit militant uh, is Islam, like uh, some people, uh, they would not like. If, for instance, a Christian is converted to Islam, no case, no problem. Everybody says that is the cho his choice, that is his own problem. But if a Muslim is converted to Christianity, his life is in danger. And those who are known to maybe have spoken to him may be in danger also. So this is a challenge. Not only a challenge to the faith, but also a very negative note in the issue of neighborliness in society. It should be assumed that anybody who is mature and uh, of age can take a decision about what he wants to do with himself. But that privilege is not there in militant Islam. So it's a challenge. Now in the West, in the, West um, the West is becoming more and more secular. Secularism is the major problem. So that the, the, you, don't, you cannot easily say that something is Christian or something is unchristian. That is the problem in the West. Of course, coupled with teachings that are very, very contrary to the Christian uh, biblical theology. You see, uh, this homo uh, homosexual practice is not just 
the teaching about sex is a fundamental uh, rebellion against the authority of scriptures. It's a rebellion against the Bible. Take a good example of Ireland. Ireland is a strong, staunch Roman Catholic country. But today they have voted to go homosexual. In fact, their present prime minister is a homosexual, open one. So how do you account for that? So modernity as yeah, secularism, so all sorts of teaching coming into the church. In some places, not only homosexuality, bestiality is allowed. Human beings have sex with animals. Recently it was reported that a lady from Germany went to South Africa and gave birth to three puppies. He delivered dogs because, and the lady confessed that he had sex with dogs and uh, that in, his, in her own country it's not an offense, so they should not disturb Port Pasquotla. So when you take all these things into account, you see that there is a challenge. In the East, India, China and all these other countries, Japan and so on, they have their own challenge based on their own environment. Because there is no country that is an island now. Like they say, the world is now a small village. So the old system is breaking down. In the language of Chino Achebe, the center can no longer go because things have fallen apart. That is this, the challenge that Christianity is facing. is everywhere. Everywhere. Before, there was, a, there was one something this, that was sent to my WhatsApp. They said, well, they showed two ladies. One was decently dressed and on the street. They say this is a prostitute soliciting for customers. Then they put another one that was even more scantily dressed. They say this is a chorister in the church in 2017. Praising God. So in other words, the prostitute of before is even more decent than the so-called uh, gospel singers of today in the church of God. Uh, before we take a leave, let me just uh, uh, take some more uh, questions with His Grace. Uh, you can also continue this conversation online with us. Uh, you can throw up your questions, uh, which will also be attended to in the subsequent episode of the exclusive to the primate. Your Grace. The issue between the Pentecostals and the Orthodox churches, uh, there's, there's this belief years back that uh, Orthodox churches are losing so much ground to the Pentecostal. Uh, with programs you have put in place, how much ground uh, is, the, is the Anglican church are gaining? And uh, is the fear is the threat of losing more members, are sti is it still real? You see, any new thing is attractive. You hear me? Yeah. Any new thing is attractive. Until, for instance, on October 31st this year, the Anglican Church came to the age of 500 years. Five hundred years is not five hundred days. There is a system. There is an age-honored tradition. There is knowledge, a corpus of books and uh, documents. 
that have been over the years. That is not what you gain in three days. So, the first thing about the new generations, the new generation churches are still in their infancies. What I mean by in their infancies, most of them are still being led by their founders. They have not even succeeded to have a transition from one man to the other, from another to the other, from another to the other. They have not survived any crisis. So they are not a threat. At the moment, they are rushing to gather rich people. What they do not realize is that rich people are not assets to church. Teach. Rich people are very dangerous to church tradition, to church leadership. They don't like to obey. They want the church to obey them. They, they are life, some of them have many things that they cannot bring to the open. And yet they want the church to be silent about that. So if you have some, some of such people, they are going to destroy the church. Because they will introduce contradictions, hypocrisy, and all sorts of things there. So the young churches should not think that uh, they have made it. They have not made it. In fact, they have not, they are not yet a church. They are just in the process of formation. Now, whether the fear is still there or not, there have never been any fear. If you go to any Anglican church here, the church is as full as it has always been. The clergy are developing. Training is going on. So, we are grateful to God that we have been used, particularly the Anglican church. I speak with my mouth wide open that most of these Pentecostal churches came from us. And if they don't recognize us as their fathers and grandparents, then uh, there is something missing. There is a belief pro something. They said they were doing competition. The upper and one chief. The chief claimed to have everything. So they came for competition. Then they asked the, the chief, what do you have that you come to challenge the upper like that? He started to mention his achievements. He started to mention his wealth. Then, when after he has exhausted his uh, resources, they asked the Oba, what do you have? Oba said, this man is, so first of all, my product. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Your Grace, uh, coming back to some of the programs which God has inspired you to bring up, uh, one of it is the DIFCON. Uh, DIFCON is a program that comes annually in Abuja at, uh, at the Ecumenical Center. Uh, have you instituted any mechanism to ensure that DIFCON out, outlasts your tenure? Hey, you see, the Anglican Church is such a church that it doesn't belong to somebody. It's not a personal thing. I met some things here, and I'm carrying on with it, necessarily so. So when I finish my period, I sign the paper and all this and that, bye bye you, I go my way. The person coming in, he knows that he too, sooner or later, he will go away, and another person takes over. So that is one thing about the system here. Yeah. Uh, nobody is not identified with uh, this is this man's project this is this man's project this, since Ajayi Crowder it has been like that and it will remain like that so there is guarantee for continuity and sustainability finally your grace uh, what actually inspired you to establish this program and what is the ultimate objective um, the inspiration came when 
as a result of meditation, we discover that most of the meetings that we have, even though it has avenue for prayer, worship, and uh, all sorts of things, they are essentially administrative meetings. Like synod, like standing committee, like uh, even IFAC, and other youth programs. We gather, but we have formal meetings, administrative meetings also. So I felt under God that we should just gather for the purpose of spirituality. Do nothing else. Speak to a, a, a defy people, minister, ministrations, prayer, fellowship, and let God, people be free in order to worship God. More than that, let other people who are not necessarily Anglicans come to join so that iron sharpens iron. Death Christian. Thank you for being with me on this episode of The Exclusive this week. And I want to encourage you to join us online on this conversation. The conversation continues online. And uh, you can be part of it. You can throw up more questions, uh, possibly that we've not exhausted in this episode, uh, so that uh, the primates can attend to some of these questions. I remain your home, Korede Akitsunde. Thank you and God bless you. This is crazy.